Anyway, she's visiting a law professor at Liberty University School of Law. She attended the event. Several admitted pedophiles were in attendance, in addition to many academics and university professors. The keynote address was given by Dr. Fred Berlin of John Hopkins University, who proclaimed that he wants to completely support the goal of Before You Act. And this is what came out of it, um, these assertions. Pedophiles are unfairly stigmatized and demonized by society. Unfairly, you know. The majority of pedophiles are gentle and rational, very rational to do that to children. There was concern about vice-laden diagnostic criteria and cultural baggage of wrongfulness. We are not required to interfere with or inhibit our child's sexuality. Children are not inherently unable to consent to sex with an adult, meaning that they are able, they're claiming here. I guess the baby goes goo ga 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 you know, or something before they scream. Yeah. An adult's desire to have sex with children is normative. You all know that, don't you? I'm sure all of you out there know that, right? This is from PhDs, folks, because this is the agenda. Back with more after this break. Hi folks, I'm back, cutting through the matrix and just talking about, this is a, they have this meeting every year, I can remember the previous ones too, same thing, to, to normalize it and at least get the idea into folks' heads so that when it's actually made law it will seem quite natural to them and most of them won't have children anyway or they've given them away or they've killed them before birth, that, that's the society you're in. And this goes on, this, art, this article here, it says, this is a list of things that the the pedophiles are, are claiming. They say that um, uh, our society should maximize individual liberty. And that's what I'm saying. I've said that before. Obviously, if one group says this is a sexual preference, what's wrong with the next group saying, well, this is our sexual preference too? I mean, uh, what are you going to say to them? Yeah. And this is we have a highly moralistic society that is not consistent with liberty. In Western culture, sex is taken too seriously. Anglo-American standard on age of consent is new and puritanical. In Europe, it was always set at 10 or 12, which is nonsense. Ages of consent beyond that are relatively new and very strange, especially for boys. They've always been able to have sex at any age. Really, well, if pedophiles are doing things to you, whether you like it or not, they're, they're going to do it. I guess that's, that would be true for them. Assuming children are unable to consent lends itself to criminalization and stigmatization. A consensus belief by both speakers and pedophiles in attendance was that because it vilifies MAPS, pedophilia should be removed as a mental disorder from the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in the same manner as homosexuality was removed in 1973. And that was a political pressure that moved it, not by what they claimed was their science of psychiatry. If it was a science, you couldn't change the science, but, well, politics did it. It says, there's no greater moral imperative than the protection of the innocent, especially defenseless children. These timeless and universal truths are embedded in the Judeo-Christian principles uh, and moral precepts uh, union, which American society and legal system are based. Any adult, especially university professor or medical doctor who cannot grasp such elementary morality, has no business teaching, counseling, or treating anyone, especially dangerous predators, with an appetite for children. What, I mean, you just think, if that's a sexual preference, and they're, and they're using other ones who've already got rights, um, what about the ones that want to kill the children after they've had sex with them? That's their, that's what turns them on, you know. That's their preference. You understand how you can't go down the slippery slope? What the academics are doing that is providing comfort and support for child rapists and molesters is unconscionable and unethical. Instead of helping to suppress these abusers' sick desires, correct their delusional attractions and moderate or hopefully cure their mental illness, these professionals sympathize with the, the perfect monsters and minimize the evil they perpetrate. Rather than work to suppress the abomination in these pedophiles' minds and souls, the academics stroke the warped passions with the fuel of justification, rationalization, and normalization. Well, you see, there's no cure for it as such. There's no cure as such. There's been things that have been done before, but no real cure. And the ones that get out of prison generally reoffend, even if they've been in for 30 years. They, they just go straight back to it. It's their little secret world, you know, of, of, of infancy. That's what they try to live in. 
And again, it's like it's a psychopathic thing too, because after they've raped the child, they'll justify why they raped them, saying the child wanted to do this in their little imaginative Disneyland world that they live in. Oh, the child really loved me. That's what they'll tell you. Anyway, as says, and the treachery doesn't stop. There are academics like Fred Berlin, MD, PhD, Nancy Nyquist, Potter, PhD, and others are also attempting to destroy societal protections of children by pushing to declassify this dangerous perversion as a mental illness and decriminalize the behavior of, in essence, they advocate the elimination of statutory rape and sexual offender registration laws designed to protect minors from being sexually exploited by adults, thus removing the ability of the state to punish and incarcerate these monsters. How many other potential predators who previously suppressed their lust for fear of incarceration, societal rebuke, and sexual predator registration laws will now be encouraged to succumb to their perverse impulses, cheered on and defended by credentialed academics and fully protected by neutered legal system? Well, well, we'll get past the neutered bit. Anyway, that's really what's going on, as I say. But it's, it's in concert, this, act, this actual meeting. Uh, with uh, articles coming out of the United Nations who are actually pushing for it too worldwide and other and even other groups across the world who belong to their own form of map, as they call it, uh, such as in Holland. They've had to have little demonstrations, about four of them, I think, in Holland, uh, who uh, are pushing for the same thing. So they want it decriminalized. And I get that their children are up for grab, you know. I guess they bring candy and, and ice cream and things like that, you know. But that's the world, that's the world that you're really living in. And, uh, even in Canada, we've had a, a similar thing happen here too, just recently, where a, a woman gave birth to a child, uh, she tossed it over a, some, a neighbor's fence, I guess, just to let them clear up the mess. And she was let go by the judge who stated that it was, it was basically, um, it's close to abortion, close, close enough not to have anything done about it. So uh, I, she's been given three years suspended sentence, and uh, that's the start of something new. Uh, so when you have your child, if you didn't go for abortion, then you change your mind, you just toss it over your fence near someone else's uh, garden, and, um, and it's, it's okay, it's, it's close to abortion. So that's it, live births are now for your game. Uh, for, for, that's interesting too. One top abortionist said some, something similar where he said that if the child's about three days old, he said that, that, that he wanted to go ahead and change the laws and so he could still kill them at three, three days old. But I'll talk about this when I come back from this break. Hi folks, we're back cutting through the matrix and I'm just reading uh, an article here from Ontario to show you how precedents are made, because this is a precedent for across the country, obviously, and other countries will follow very quickly. Nothing happens by itself in a country. It's always meant to be international. It takes off, if you haven't noticed, your whole life long. Anyway, it says that the judge defends infanticide by comparing it to abortion. Inciting Canada's abortion laws, an Edmonton appeal court uh, ruled that an Alberta woman who strangled her son with her underwear after secretly giving birth in 2005 will face no guaranteed jail time. Katrina Effert was sentenced Friday for killing her newborn and then throwing the body over a fence into the neighbor's yard on April 13, 2005, when she was 19. She was given a three-year suspended sentence by Judge Joanne Vitt, uh, whereby, uh, wherein if she abides by the court's decisions for the next three years, uh, I guess that's if you don't throw any more babies over fences or neighbors, she will not spend time behind bars. And it says... Um, uh, CBC notes the justification given by the judge for such an astounding sentence. The fact that, and this is what she says, the, ca- the fact that Canada has no abortion laws reflects that while many Canadians undoubtedly view abortion as a less than ideal solution to unprotected sex and unwanted pregnancy, they generally understand, accept and sympathize with the owner's demands pregnancy and childbirth extract from mothers, especially mothers without support, she writes. You understand the whole culture is kaput. You understand it was meant to go this way because in the United Nations Charter, too, and many many of their talks and, and their, on the, and their articles and websites, they say they must destroy the individual. That also means destroying individual responsibility for your own actions. And the state will take care of everybody, you see. And it says here, 
The judge noted that infanticide laws and sentencing guidelines were not altered when the government made many changes to the criminal code in 2005, which she says shows that Canadians view the law as a fair compromise of all the interests involved. Naturally, Canadians are grieved by an infant's death, especially at the hands of the infant's mother, but Canadians also grieve for the mother. Actually, Canadians are, are like most folk today, where they've had, gone on so many years of state-paid uh, abortions. There's no value now to having children. That's the, re- the truth of it. Children, we've been told for many, many, are a burden, terrible burden. That's what Charles Galton Darwin has said in his book, Next Million Years, that we can convince the mothers to go and get cars and, and jobs rather than have children will have achieved their ends. And so, so material goods are far more important than having children. Children really, when you, when you abort so many annually, how can you turn around and say we care about children? It doesn't wash, does it? We don't like children anyhow, eh? Isn't that how it goes, that song? The judge also rejected the arguments that the single father and the grandparents also face the same stress of the mind as a mother who kills her own baby. Anyway, the, the defense lawyer, Peter Royal, said it was unjust and almost mean to incarcerate her for the 16 days of jail time. She must still serve for throwing her son's body over a fence. And that's just a sign of where you're going. You're going to see a lot more in the, in the near future, too, because you're not supposed to be responsible for your own actions. The state's supposed to always pick up the tab and, and take over your life and, and make you do all the, the, the state's things. for them. You know, That's how it works in this sort of communistic system at the bottom with the fascists at the top. And this article here, too, is again uh, all comes out uh, at the same time, as I say, that they're having the meetings at the United Nations to, to uh, further destroy what's left of any human decency. And it says the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is offering advice to parents and teens about sex education, including assurances that teens may experiment with homosexuality as part of exploring their own sexuality and that masturbation should be of concern only if a child seems preoccupied with it to the exclusion of other activities. That means, I guess, if they stop playing with their little game boxes and things. The information located on questions and answers about sex linked on the Quick Guide to Healthy Living portion of the HHS website also describes children and infants as this ties in with the, last, the, the previous... Uh, Articles two articles ago about um, children being able to get consent to, to sex. Also describes children and infants as sexual beings. You see, this is this is your Department of Health and Human Services, the U.S. Department. Under the question, of when do they call it kids? A kid's a young goat, by the way. That was part of what Lenin says: you got to dehumanize the enemy. Start becoming curious about sex. The answer notes that infants have curiosity about their bodies. They're taking the Freudian approach there. So uh, children are human beings and therefore sexual beings, the Q&A web page says. It's hard for parents to acknowledge this, but just as hard for kids to think of their parents as sexually active. But even infants have curiosity about their own bodies, which is healthy and normal, but they generally get over that, you know. And then it goes masturbation and what sort of sexual behavior do young children exhibit. Parents should only be concerned about masturbation. If a child seems preoccupied, blah, 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 blah. Victims of sexual abuse sometimes become preoccupied with self-stimulation. And then it goes into sexual attraction and orientation and all the different things you can choose from these days, I guess. But that's, you understand, what I'm saying here is that this was not something that came out of the blue. I've lived long enough to watch the big movements that were financed by the foundations and, and would demonstrate on the streets by the same crew all the time. And I've watched it get pushed step by step by step. Big money, big money, big agenda. And uh, this is how you bring a society down. Look at the, all the ancient cultures. Greece was the same at the end, so was Rome. And here you are today, uh, so that those who rule have more power over ruling you because of the chaos that it causes. And that's how you destroy cultures. Most wars, most more countries have been taken down by economic wars. Those with the money decide the rules, you see. And they decide the court systems and they get their appointees into politics and everywhere else they want to put them because they have all the contacts and the cash. But that's how you destroy countries. Quite easy to do. There's nothing difficult in it at all. So... That's part of how you bring down society. You must destroy it at its very foundations. And when children are not safe, you've pretty well won. You've, you've pretty well won then.